Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Anthony Peak Consciousness, uh, not Consciousness Hour this time. Sorry, I've lost my Zoom link. Um, you just bear with me a second. Right. OK, that's better. Yes. Thanks, everybody. And welcome to another edition of um, Incom. Today's guest is somebody I've known for many, many years uh, and indeed is one of the few individuals that uh, visited me at my home in West Sussex to interview me a few weeks ago, where we had a fascinating two hour discussion on matters esoteric. And it, I would say it was probably one of the most interesting interviews I've done because Greg really knows my work very well. And our guest today is Greg Moffat, who is the, the brains behind um, the Legalized Freedom, which is an extremely popular UK podcast. But Greg is a much more interesting person than that. His, his background and, and history is so fascinating in so many ways that I'm hoping that we'll dig in a little bit and we can discuss as well as our areas of mutual interest interest, also areas to do with um, music, um, art, various other things as well. So without further ado, Greg, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit of background, because even I don't know fully the story of Greg Moffat and, and your musical career and everything else. So if you can tell us a little bit, that'd be really great. Okay, well, thanks, Anthony. Thanks, Sarah, for having me today. Um, just to reiterate what you said, for the last 10 years, I've been doing the uh, legalizefreedom.com uh, podcast there's other material there as well videos and written articles but mostly podcasts many of which featured yourself of course topics are many and varied anything that interests me really but there is a you know a heavy emphasis on weird wonderful wacky out there topics and consciousness research quantum physics such like um, I've also was a in music uh, laterally any topic I, I'm, I'm interested in really so there's a lot of uh, cultural comment even uh, making its way into the Legalized Freedom podcasts. Prior to that, I, was a, I still do journalism. I still write, of course, but I did that professionally for over 25 years for some of the biggest magazines um, in the world, laterally websites, mostly music. And I was a professional musician for three years as well. And th that's really what's made up those kind of three areas that have made up the bulk of my life to date. Um, my energy currently um, is devoted to podcasting um, because uh, I really feel I started it in the first place because there were certain topics I was very interested in and I was talking to friends and family about very passionately, but then I realized it was pointed out to me actually that I wasn't reaching very many people. So that's why I launched a website. So that's my, where my energies currently are. And um, yeah, you, you, you know, your work is just, it's the perfect fit for what I do really, because you're not um, tied to any one particular area. Yeah, there's threads running through what you do, but you branch off wherever you, you're, you're led, wherever you want to go. You know, you're not corralled in these, um, these sort of categories that researchers and, and scientists, et cetera, et cetera, get themselves put into. So I think you can ask me if there's anything else to add, but I think that's a reasonable summary of, of where we are up until today. OK, because that sounds fascinating in itself. Um, but just just to, to dig a little bit more deeply in in your involvement in the music world, when you were with uh, Cradle of Filth, I mean, I've checked out their music and it's it's curiously melodic. It is far more melodic than I expected it to be. I thought it was going to be sort of more bombast and everything else as well. And I know and I've looked at the videos of when it when the band are referenced many, many times in the IT crowd. And I think that was absolutely wonderful and incredibly amusing. Thing. But I find the lyrics quite fascinating as well. Um, and can you tell me a little bit about what the background to that was? And, you know, what was the, the basic viewpoint on things? Because their, their lyrics are very mystical and, and quite powerful, aren't they? Well, that phase of my career I kind of got into accidentally, even though I've been playing music for years and years before that. It was on a, you know, just amateur basis. Um, so, yeah, I fell into that. It's not something I stress. It's something that people quite often show interest in. Because as the history of the band and that musical genre in general has unfolded, the work that I just happened to be part of has turned out to be, you know, the most popular, the most, um, uh, you know, uh, durable <laughs> of all the band's output. And, uh, you know, at least one of those records I did is considered a classic of its type. 
the lyrics are all the work of the vocalist, um, only remaining original member, um, Danny. And um, I often talked with him about his lyrics and I read most of the lyrics, certainly when I was in the band. Um, and I know he's a, he's a scholar and a very erudite um, uh, exponent of all sorts of um, occult and esoteric lore, you know, from vampirism through to Satanism and, and right across the board. Um, everything that you would put, you imagine all the, the Hammer Horror uh, film um, milieu, but actually the, the serious work behind that, you know, what lies behind all the stories. So yeah, I was a great admirer of his of his lyrical work. I'm not the one to expound on it at length, however, mm. um, because it was 100% his work, and that's he didn't write any music. He just did that and did designed um, graphics and whatnot. Um, so yeah, but I think it's very very strong lyrics overall. Um, mm. Sometimes you know to the um, <laughs> complex and verbose to the point where they're almost impossible to sing, especially when you're trying to sing them <laughs> 150 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But you, 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 you were very much the keyboardist, weren't you? And I think one of the most noticeable what, of the albums I've listened to is the keyboard playing, you know, and it, it's got this kind of portentous feel to it as well, which um, is very good. But in terms of your, your choice of name, I was intrigued by that as well, um, your stage name. What stimulated that? Uh, well. When I joined the band, they had just one album out, and I was I got a copy just to get a feel for what the band was about more. I just literally played the record. I mean, obviously I'd heard it, but um, I got a vinyl copy, and I was just looking at it, just trying to get the vibe. And I noticed that on the back, they were going for this uh, sort of formal, aristocratic attitude, you know, of like um, uh, looking down sardonically with wrath upon the, the, the mass of the population sort of thing, you know, setting themselves up as another class of human being. And I, I really like that idea, you know, that sort of arrogance. And uh, not that that's me as such, but I, it, again, you're playing a role for the most part. Um, and I noticed that they'd all used the, the full expression of their, their names. Now, well, Danny was Danny, but Rob called himself Robin. Nick called himself Nicholas. So it's just a way of making it more formal. Um, and I just thought, well, hang on a minute. Everyone calls me Greg. Nobody calls me Gregory apart from my mom. I don't like that. Gregory, it just doesn't, I just don't <laughs> like it. it. Just sounds like a little boy. So I was scr scr scratching around for some ideas. And this is where it came from. This is absolutely where it came from. It'll be obscure. Hardly anyone will get this. But there's an American vocalist called Glenn Danzig. Uh, he was one of the founder members of punk band, The Misfits. And um, in between The Misfits and a great success he had with his own band simply titled Danzig, he did uh, a, a run of albums with a very dark, occult, eerie, almost impossible to describe their music, called Samhain, spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, you know, which is a Gaelic Halloween. Uh, that's where that comes from. And this particular album, one of my favourites, <clears throat> there's called November Coming Fire. And I was playing it and I turned over the back and I always thought those pictures look so cool. You know, they, they can't hardly see the guy's faces and they're all outside somewhere in the desert, you know, with, 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 like, with, uh, over a bonfire. And it just looked so cool. And the guitarist, they all had just used single names as well. And the guitarist was just called Damien. And Font... I'm wondering if his name actually is Damien because the font used on the, the, the album sleeve, the Samhain album sleeve, is exactly the same as the font used for the Omen films where the little boy is called Damien. So if you look at the Omen and Omen 2, the, the font they use in, on the uh, you know, DVD or on the yes. soundtrack albums, exactly the same. So it all came together in my mind and I thought, that's it. So I just told Danny, and I'm glad I did because we'd already been in the studio to record something. We we're just designing the sleeve. And I said, right, we're, we're changing it. And he was like, yeah, good. Sounds good. Let's go. Wow. So it's as easy as that, because, of course, you know, my preoccupation with the concept of the daemon. And, of course, I remember watching the Omen movies many, many years ago when they first came out and really found them quite uh, quite powerful in many, many ways. So that's a little bit of back background to the, the music and everything else. But the main area is obviously is, is your own interests. And initially what stimulated you because clearly when you were choosing to do a podcast, obviously there had to be something that interested you. 
so what stimulated that interest in the particular areas because you could have done a podcast on music which would have been very easy to do but you didn't you chose something quite specific um why was that well a lot of the uh, topics that i get into these were things i've been interested in since i was really started seriously reading books so from about 1983-84 um i started reading about um you know the occult magic um all sorts of any any of the the outre subjects you know the, the the left field stuff that you and i are interested in um you know the cutting edge science at the time um astronomy archaeology particularly anything that was that was saying what the world that uh, you perceive how you think it is it's not really like that there's much more to it than that you know your eyes are, are deceiving you in some way um i read eric von Daniken at the time um he was a very popular author in the 60s and 70s now people say he's been widely discredited that wasn't really the point the point was that reading von Daniken just set my mind on fire and it opened me up to the idea that maybe what i learned in school and what i was getting from the mainstream was to some extent bullshit or at least could be questioned so uh, books like that just you know opened my mind to this whole other world and i just um i gradually began to or stopped reading novels i hardly ever read novels now or non-fiction and so it all stems back from then but it took a very long time you know that was to the 80s and i carried on doing that to the 90s and the 2000s and it wasn't until um 2010 2011 when I, was, I had done a music uh, podcast, actually, for Bloodstock Festival. I did that for a couple of years. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd always wanted to be a DJ, you know. You get to control what records you play. You know, <laughs> Don't take calls, no emails. I'm just playing here. You listen or don't. <laughs> uh, but it was, again, it was this point I was going on. I can't remember what the subject was, but I was talking to my girlfriend at the time about this particular subject. Uh, I think I actually came downstairs from my study and said, I think I might know what the meaning of life is. Let me run this by you. And she, she eventually said, well, this is really, really interesting, but, you know, have you considered doing something with it? So I decided to do a blog, but pretty quickly realized that I don't actually like reading a lot online. I do do quite a bit of it, but I, it's not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to write screeds and screeds and screeds. Um, and, you know, because I, I was going to get in the way. I thought I can work much faster and more intuitively and more flexibly if it's like a format a little bit like what we're doing here. And so eventually in 2012, um, April 1st, I launched, and I think you were guest number three or number four, possibly. Wow, so I was, I was there right from the start. That's, that's really good. I'm really pleased to be aware of that in many, many ways. Um, and in terms of the choice of name, Legalized Freedom is quite an interesting name. How did you come by that? <laughs> Google it, you'll find that it's it's kind of not original to me, but I didn't realize that anyone else was using it for anything at the time. I was just, bear in mind, this was initially going to be a blog. I was looking for something. I, the word freedom was there all the time because whether it's physical freedom, intellectual freedom, um, any sort of, you know, mind and body, just freedom generally is something that, I, I can start talking about what freedom is, but let's not do that just now. And um I don't remember exactly how I came up with it, but I thought it sounded provocative because it was kind of, in a way, it was either um, would ask people, you know, yeah, yeah, we, we should we should be able to be free in whatever way we wish, or to some people it read like nonsense, but either way it kind of got their attention. You know, either it's a nonsensical phrase or it's a provocative phrase or something, and I wanted something short and to the point, and I didn't want to use my own name. Uh, you use your name for these videos for and I think that makes sense because you're you're an author you're published and you have a, a brand in a way that's Anthony Peake you see what I mean so people hear you they see you speaking of videos they read your books for me the star of the show was the guest really so that's why I didn't want to do the Greg Moffat show because the, the, the internet's overrun now with the you know the John Smith show and the Tom Brown mm. show and I think in that in itself though you can get lost you know Joe Rogan is is there um but I have a lot of luck, to be honest with you, I think, um, to think of the, being in the right place at the right time. But it could easily have been the Joe Who show, you know what I mean? Like, Yeah, that's an interesting point, isn't it? How important the name is when you do a podcast. Because effectively, yeah, it's just a name, isn't it? It doesn't tell you anything about the content. So if you do a web search until you've got a guest list, and even then, you know, that is the banner. The, by which you market yourself which is an interesting point right Sarah would you like to come in here with any any con any 
points or questions before we get into the really meaty stuff? Well, I was quite interested in the conversation about names. As you know, I'm quite interested in names. And, and your name, Greg, is uh, derives from the Greek, doesn't it? And that means uh, alert and the watcher. So actually quite appropriate for you, I think, in your current manifestation. <laughs> Yeah, no, I've got a little, I've got a little mug that somebody gave me when I was a child, and it's you know just Greg on it. You know, you had those things when you were little, and it just, it's a meaning, and they've chosen the word careful. Uh, mm. but I've never read it as in careful, as in like overly cautious or uh, anything like that. You know, stay at home in case you die. <laughs> but uh, I read it the same way, as in like um, observant. You know, and it's one thing, one thing I will say that I am when it comes, especially in the physical environment is that I, I, I am very observant. I do see what's there and there was things that other people don't. Yeah, I feel like our names are almost like the first spell that we have in life in some ways. Like my daughter's called Indiana Janes because I was big <laughs> with Indiana Jones um, when she was a yeah, I'm actually. And she's always said, oh my God, my, my name's ridiculous. It's like a joke <laughs> name. You've just given me a joke name. And then when we watched the Indiana Jones movies recently, she's now decided she wants to be an archaeologist and go to Edinburgh and uh, study ancient Scottish um, archaeology. So, so I said to her, you know, any university you apply for and your name's Indiana Jones, you'll probably get the gig. <laughs> when you had your conversation, Anthony, recently with Mitchell for uh, you I've still not had a chance to watch the whole thing, but you briefly mentioned the naming phenomenon, giving a name to things mm. and... How important it is and in terms of science it could be naming something you don't understand we'll call it dark matter so therefore we're halfway there to knowing what it is but you're not you're just giving it a name and sarah's absolutely right about the first spell the first spelling is giving a name to a child for example or a dog or a cat or a fish or whatever and i was talking to somebody the other day about this and i was joking about in the tv comedy show bottom with rick mail and adrian edson the pub landlords called the richard head of course, mm. everyone calls it Dick. <laughs> and the person I was talking to said, oh, I actually knew someone who was Christian Richard Head, and he changed his name by deed poll as soon as he was able to do so. And there's even, I've read things about names before, how, uh, you know, they say there can be a prejudice against short people, particularly short men. Yeah. I, I have seen that Napoleon complex at work. It, it's, it is a thing. Not with all men or women, for that matter. Um, but I've read things about people with the name Little, Mm. Uh, even if they're six foot five they tend i read about this when i was at school actually we're all more or less the same size that 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 would would somehow even in the back of someone's mind and the depth of their life, it would affect how they perceived you hello mr little you know somehow diminish mm. the person words are so powerful they are the kind of matrix of human consciousness really aren't they they're the framework that hold our ideas and our perception of things all together i mean i think um you know, with regard to names, like I didn't like my name when I was a kid because everyone was called Sarah. But as I'm getting older and I'm into Egyptology, Sarah to me is like being called daughter of the sun. And now it suddenly seems like much more special and important. So although actually I should have a T in if I'm going to be daughter of the sun in ancient Egypt, in the ancient Egyptian language. But we used to... um when uh, Indy was a baby, I live in Hastings and the Hastings Observer ran this uh, cutest baby of the year award, which I obviously entered my adorable baby into. But I did slick her hair so she looked a bit like Ricky Gervais and she was very shiny in the photograph. So she didn't win, unfortunately. But um, we, my uh, partner at the time created top trumps out of all of the babies in this newspaper printed out because they were hilarious. And they had such good names. One of them was called... Um, Angel Hunter, which I don't think anyone really thought about, you know, how that might come across. And one of the other kids I remember was called Lacey Underwood. <laughs> <laughs> I remember in my first year at university, um, one of the, the girls I knew, um, I'll give her a name in a second, but it seemed such a strange name that there was a, at the, in the campus newspaper, there was a headline and her, the girl's name was Fiona Bracegirdle. And it actually said, Fiona Bracegirdle, we love you. And she was really quite upset about her name being mocked. But apparently Bracegirdle is a very old Cheshire name. And it is true how names 
a strange. I mean, when when many years ago I worked um, uh, at Tetley Tetley Tea Factory, um, which is not anything like people believe the Tetley Tea Factory to be. The advert, you know, you have all these e by gun Northerners, and it's in fact down in um, in Greenford in Middlesex, so you don't have any kind of e by gun Tetley. But two of the managers I worked with, one was called Rick O'Shea, and one was called Rick Shaw. And we used to have lunch together. And, you know, you, you kind of think, what kind of parent does that? And I remember reading once an article turning around and saying, if your name is Crapper, it is self-evident that your family either lived on a mountain and never had any communication with anybody else, or you were all deaf. Um, because, you know, it's something that people, but probably people have pride in it. Now, i would not made the link with the name Gregory and Egregorus. And until you'd said that before, I had not realized that Gregory is from Egregor, and which is watcher in Greek. Yes, as you say, which, which leads us in quite interestingly now to um, the way in which, because Greg, you've had so many guests on your show and you must all the time. So I noticed this when you interviewed me, you're very much a, an informational sponge. You take it all in and you put it all together. So you must be developing a very interesting worldview about the world. Now, you, you sent Sarah and I uh, uh, a couple of essays that you wrote, both of which were brilliant, by the way. And the ideas of the way in which technology is changing us and the way um, we're getting changed by the world we are in. And I was just wondering, has your worldview changed from the people you've interviewed? And who of the people that interviewed you, who are the ones that you made think, wow, no, that's really interesting. I had not thought about that before. Um, well, I would say probably the where I find myself at the minute, if you wanted to, to boil things down to like a basis for a worldview or cosmology, I find myself leaning towards um, what's known as idealism. Um, and it was Bernardo Castrop's work. I've had him on uh, quite a few times. And uh, even though I was what he sets out, the idealist position in terms of consciousness being fundamental to reality, um, matter being within mind, not the other way around. That his, those ideas are not new as such, but he was the first guy that I came across, uh, first of all, to set out the idealist um, concept in layman's terms, so it's easily understandable for pretty much anybody. And then second, to put it on a scientific footing, which he did with his book, The Idea of the World, um, very cleverly did that. Um, each one chapter of that book was created as a separate article and submitted at different times to various um, scientific journals, all peer reviewed. Now, this is the problem he'd had prior to this was people dismissing his ideas as woo woo and unscientific. And you know, the people who put, putting him in the category of people who abuse quantum physics to justify just about any nonsense. I know you're you know, hard on that, um, Anthony. So he submitted these articles at different times. They're all peer reviewed, all successfully published and he then put them all together which was always his intention into the book and then the invitation was to all my scientific skeptics and pseudo-skeptics well this is all peer-reviewed by your colleagues what do you think of this so to answer your question in a roundabout way I think it's finding that idealist position which I was kind of you know, aware of but not necessarily by name and having it articulated like that has probably been the the biggest shift or the, you know, the, the most profound kind of crystallization of ideas it's come to inform how I think reality works. And this is a work in progress, of course. I'm not saying that that's the way it is, but it's the one that makes the most sense. And as Castro himself points out, it's the most parsimonious. It's the one that takes the least um, amount of stuff for granted, as it were. So it, it, idealism is a form of consciousness being fundamental and all else um, arises from that in ways that we do not yet understand, may never understand. Yeah, because it's one of the things that I've, I've long discussed and the, the concept of idealism has long fascinated me from the, the philosophers I studied many, many years ago. And of course, it is, it is the most logical. And as you say, you know, if you're going to imply, apply Occam's razor to these kind of things, you know, what, what is the most logical thing? Well, the only thing you know empirically, using the term empiricism in its literal sense, is that I am something perceiving something. You know, all your information stops at the point of perception. 
and everything else is is an addition to that in one way or another. And I found it, I used to get very annoyed when I used to see the criticism of Bishop Berkeley, you know, the uh, the, the refutation by the stone, you know, the idea of um, you refute it by kicking a stone and you feel the stone and therefore you've proved that physical reality exists outside. And I always thought, you know, that that was very much a very weak argument because there definitely seems to be something strange about the world, strange about the universe, strange about everything. And I suppose when you do the kind of work you do, you find that central. And Sarah, I know that it's something that you've been very much interested in, you know, in your work on dreaming, you know, the idea of the realities that we perceive as the reality outside, but there's still a reality that's given to us by our senses when we're dreaming in the same way, isn't there? Yeah, I, I think we are... Um, just using other systems to perceive the physical reality when we're dreaming and we're creating visual content in response to non-conscious um, sensory input. So, and I also, you know, one of my big interests is this idea of, you know, when we're babies, we spend so much time in REM sleep. I think we're laying down the foundations of our kind of uh, the memory palaces of our personality and our psyche. And we slowly build those up um, over time. So I think our, our, in a way, our personality and the way we perceive our waking reality is formed in the dreaming space and formed in, um, you know, I, th I think as well, like memory is something that doesn't get talked about with regards much to consciousness, but I sort of feel that memory is holding all of this stuff together because without memory, we're not really conscious of anything that's happening to us. And, um, you know, I, I think it's the reason why history is so important because history and a, a knowledge of history serves the purpose of being a collective memory for humanity. And one of the big issues at the moment is we are oblivious to our own history. You know, history isn't something that's taught very well in schools at the moment or as part of the kind of national curriculum. So people are just feeling lost and confused about why we are in the world that we're in but usually there's very strong evidence for why we've ended up where we are because of our history as a as a species on the planet we undergo, we, we undergo a gaslighting collectively when it comes to history you know the way in the classic term of someone being uh, mentally abused with gaslighting told that you know up is down black and white black is white left is right you know truth is a lie and being bombarded with this, you know, with no other outside influence and beginning to question their own sanity or come to believe something that's contrary uh, to reality. I think that we see that collectively gaslighting in terms of history, certainly from a mainstream, mainstream perspective. History is constantly, you know, if the future isn't set, then neither is the past. Uh, it seems that the, the past can be manipulated and changed. You know, you don't really, it didn't really happen like that. You've misremembered you know, and used for various uh, purposes and agendas. I suppose the whole problem with history and, you know, my, one of my degrees was in history and it always used to fascinate me. There's a book written by a guy called E.H. Carr, which was, re which was required reading for first year historians. And it's the question, the book was, what is history? And of course the history is, and I'm, I, I cannot remember who originally made the statement, but, you know, history is the history of the victor. You know, the, the victors write the history. And of course, if you think about it, you, you've got no real way of knowing whether history ever happened the way we're told it happened. Because you can, go, you can if you have not gone back to the source documents yourself, you don't know. And then it's a question of interpretation in many, many ways. And it's coming back again, isn't it, to the idealistic view, the idealist viewpoint, you know, that that do we in some way co-create external reality by our expectations of external reality? You know, that we believe that, that this is what's about to happen and it just happens. And of course, again, in the area we're both interested in, this is a very fundamental idea, isn't it? You know, the idea of what can we genuinely believe is true? And what is there any such thing as objective truth? And if there is, what is the arbiter for ultimate truth? Well, it's a concept of uh, just sort of a quantum physics note, uh, the retro causality idea uh, where uh, the future can alter the past uh, so that the past then matches up with how the future pans out, as it were. <clears throat> so that basic concept, I think you could have, depending on what way you wanted to look at at uh, time, 
um, or history or memory, individual or collective, um, that can be brought into play, really. As I say, I don't think that, um, I think that the, <clears throat> given what I believe about linear time being not, not an illusion, but a device, you know, a way for us to say, you know, framework for us to hang what apparently is our experience, what appear to be our perceptions, just to kind of make sense of it, you know, put it in an, some kind of arrangement that means that we don't lose our minds. We go, okay, no, I've got ha that happened then. This hasn't yet happened. It may not happen. Um, given that I think that, then I think the um, past, what we call the past and the future are definitely up for grabs. And uh, it's interesting. Um, I've, I've done a lot of shows uh, with remote viewers and uh, remote viewing. If you're not sure what that is, you can look it up. It's basically perception at a distance uh, beyond the normal limits of time and space. It's interesting in some of the people I've talked to about their when they've looked at histor historical events and historical you know, places in the past and how they look different from what we believe. Now, of course, they could just be completely getting it wrong. I accept that. But I've done a, a lot of work in this area and some of it's been genuinely very interesting and had no reason to, to write it off as well. This room of yours just got it wrong. It just makes you think about, um, again, history being written by the victors or whoever has the most money or whatever, how much of uh, the past, particularly in terms of our species, is as we believe it to be or is as it's presented to us. And of course, we get to a certain point in any event, and it's the point of history that interests me the most, the antediluvian period. So basically anything when you get so far back in the past that human events just disappear in a fog and a, a convenient cutoff point would be the, the last ice age. You know, what can we really say about civilization? I don't just mean about hominids and about archaeological finds. What can we say about civilization or technology or consciousness? Um, any of that prior to that period? Currently, not a lot. And I just find that really, really interesting. So for people who hand us, you know, this is the, this is human history. And, but you notice how that has expanded. Like certainly when I was at school, all of human history was presented in, in a, a thick tome that now would be like 50%, if not more irrelevant, has been, you know, surpassed um, and replaced by, you know, better research or other findings. So, yeah, that's a bit of a nebula. It's not really a question or a point of me there, but it's just some thoughts on mm. history and on time and perception in that regard. I think it's a really interesting one because one of the uh, the areas that I've written about and I write about in the new book is Richard Feynman's um, uh, Sum Over Histories, um, which argues that every subatomic particle takes every every journey between point A and point B, every possible route it could take. And then effectively, after taking all the routes, the one that's the easiest then collapses statistically into the route it actually takes, which means if you to look at his argument of sum over histories, this is suggesting that there are multiple histories filtering in to this nexus point and then multiple outcomes from the systems as well. So it means that, you know, if somebody views, um, I mean, I have issues with remote viewing, but, you know, there is a counter argument to say that if somebody remote views into a time, you can't necessarily say that they're remote viewing into this particular timeline. They could be remote viewing into an alternate timeline. And again, if you look at the work of people like J.W. Dunn and his argument that there are, time is serial and there's levels of time, and like, like, like the rind of an onion, and we move within those times. And again, as uh, uh, um, Philip K. Dick said, there's an orthogonal time that can run at right angles to that time. And of course, then you get the issue of time and space are the same thing. You know, time changes into space and change the faster you get to the speed of light, they start to convert into each other. So suddenly time becomes quite strange. So the, 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 the structures by which we look at historical facts are, are different and can be different. And it's something that really struck me in your essay that you wrote about, about the way technology is changing us. And it's how we have information now immediately at hand in terms of history. You can pursue any particular angle that you wish because you'll find somewhere out there on the web, somebody who's got a particularly obscure worldview that will support your own worldview. And this is exactly what you were saying in the essay, wasn't it? How dangerous it is now. The technology is, is taking us over, but it's dumbing us down. It's not making us more intelligent. It's making us more fine-tuned to particular belief systems. Yeah, well, information is not knowledge. 
as such. And I think that's what we're drowning in currently is information and uh, much of it useful and might constitute knowledge or um, at least indicate a path towards knowledge. But trying to, it's like wood and tree sort of situation at the minute, isn't it really? So, yeah, people can find that article um, at legalizefreedom.com. You just click on articles at the top and you, you'll find that particular one if you want to go through it. But yeah, I think we're in a, we're, uh, how technology is developing, I think, is a great concern to me at the moment. I'm not talking about the usual Luddite concerns about people being glued to their phones all the time. Of course, that is a thing. But um, Rudolf Steiner had it. Um, so a recent book I read, Paul Emerson, he's a Steiner scholar, no longer with us, and his little book, Machines and the Human Spirit, I think I've got that right. He articulates Steiner's idea of two types of technology um, that he, he saw dominating the 20th century, now into the 21st, what Steiner simply refers to as atomic technology. And that isn't just uh, you know nuclear power, that's part of it, but it's... Um, it's fossil fuels, it's, uh, it's microchips, it's, it's a broad gamut of things that we recognize today as our modern suite of technologies. And he sees that as a problem uh, because it's disconnected from, when I say human spirit, that starts again to sound fluffy and woo-woo and spiritual and pseudo-religious. But um, even if you're not, don't consider yourself spiritual, think of it as like it's disconnected from kind of our, how are going to put it, anything really human, if you see what I mean. So it's disconnected from that, and it's it's actually to some extent squashing that, pushing it down, in danger of extinguishing it. And the type of t technology that Steiner speaks about in Emerson's book, I just cannot remember the name for it. But let's just say it's the right technology, not spiritual, but some kind of technology that makes sense. Basically, that we can almost be part of. And I think um, I don't mean in a, in a transhumanist. Uh, type of fashion, but I think that's where that transhumanist impulse comes from, this idea of being at one with technology. But I think in Steiner's um, cosmology, there is a type of technology that we develop that is always subservient to us. And it's for it's for good ends. You know, there is no there is no technology of death and destruction in that that other alternative suite of technologies. Whereas an atomic technology, even if something's designed to be benign or even positive, it's inherently problematic. You, you can't escape that. Uh, Anthony, you've gone quiet. Thank you. I put the mute on. My apologies on that. Um, one of the TV series that um, is, is showing at the moment on UK television is one that's really making me think very, very deeply about technology and how it can be played. And I can't I can't think what it is. It's to do with the, the monitoring of um, people uh, and the way in which um, we can use technology uh, and in deep in terms of things like deep fake. Uh, I can't think of this, the series Holiday Grangers in it. Um, oh, damn, I can't think what it's called now. But but effectively, it's the idea that technology is so powerful now that you cannot believe anything you see, that things can be manipulated. We know ourselves, you know, I, you know, I've played with these these things online, you know, whereby you can get um, a picture of um, Lincoln and you can make him sing a rock song. And it looks real. And it's the question of then, you know, what is now real? Because suddenly we, we're almost like the kind of the French philosophers, Bradelhead and people like that, you know, the idea of the desert of the real, because we don't know what real is anymore. You know, we, we are given information, but we've got no way of knowing. And the, the central theme of this pro, this particular programme is that you can actually have a politician say something completely different to what they actually say. Sir, do you know the name of the programme at all? Have you come across it? No, I only watch Star Trek. Oh, right. OK. <laughs> um, oh, I can't think what it's called now. But it is the idea, isn't it, that, you know, virtual reality now is so real and everything else that we don't know what real is. And... You pointed you pointed out in the essay about you know about um, futurism and the idea of posthumanism and the idea of whether we're going to meld into machines and things and it's all very disturbing, isn't it? We are in this, as you said in your essay, one of the the other essay. You turned around and said, you know, we're in this great period of dislocation at the moment. We've got all these things now that are worrying us. You know, suddenly the security pre-COVID that we had has gone. 
we're suddenly adrift in this kind of world where we we can't control it anymore in that way i mean are you guys finding that do you feel the same way i loved um lockdown best time of my life summer of love 2020 was amazing for me i mean i know obviously lots of people had a hard time but it did highlight for me the benefits of living somewhere where you've got access to nature and I think that's something that a lot of people might have learned from the lockdown experience, if nothing too sort of tr dramatic or tragic happened to them during that period, that the access to nature is really vital for our well-being and health. And I think I'm a big fan of uh, Rudolf Steiner's writings as well, Greg. And I just looked it up. Was it resonance technology that you were talking about? That's it. That's it yeah. um, a sort of more harmonious and healthful um, type of energy. I don't know what. Um, would necessarily be conceived of as being a form of resonance technology now, but this idea of sort of approaching um, uh, perhaps things like sound waves for health purposes and, and stuff like that could be considered a sort of resonance technology, perhaps, or, or light frequencies and things like that. Yes, light. But um, I think that, you know, our, our system, the Western sort of, system of society and culture is just we're heading for one of those collapses you know we always have those collapses and um we'll reach a peak society reaches a peak and then it collapses and falls and then the whole process starts again and perhaps this sort of uh, transhumanist agenda will be um reined in because of economic issues and the fact that perhaps we just won't have the resources to um, facilitate those kinds of changes. I don't know. I mean, I think the the cure for all of us is probably just more nature connection and um, less, you know, the more we're exposed to in terms of information, like you say, the more confused we seem to be and the more ill we seem to become as well, um, collectively. And, and I think, you know, we can apply this all to sort of modern humans living in the West, but really, if you look at like small indigenous populations or people that are still well connected to the land, and they aren't spending all of their time on the internet, they're probably not in too bad a, a situation. They're probably not concerned about, um, you know, evil media companies controlling them via technology. It's, it's something that's cultural, I think. Your, your point, Sarah, about um, energy there is very, very key. Um, I think there's other energy sources potentially out there on tap them just being like renewable stuff i think there's problems with that because we have to create intermediary technology which in itself is dependent on fossil fuels but in the essay on the ones i sent you um again people could find it on the website um out of this world out of their minds uh, transhumanism and the colonization of space i point out an issue that i've raised in particular with my guests um john michael greer and james hard Constler, who are very big on this in terms of all this transhumanist and ai stuff I mean, look at the energy the internet already consumes, you know? And in terms of all these transhumanist plans, where is the energy coming from to power all this crap? Even before you get to all these um, clouds and, and, you know, uh, AI bots and all the rest of it, never mind that. Even just the technology of control and surveillance that's being put in at the moment, it's incredibly thirsty, you know, and uh, we already see the whole thing juddering under its own weight. Um, so that, that's one of my, uh, I mean, it remains to be seen how energy future plays out. But one of the things that reassures me somewhat of an evening is about a lot of these um, James Bond villain type schemes is that they probably just won't be able to do it because the, the lights will go off. You know, they're already telling EV uh, owners in California to not charge their cars because it's putting a strain on the grid and it might cause blackouts, you know. And I, so I read an article the other day, I don't know how true this is, but that depending on the lights that you have, electric lights you have in your house, that the, the smart meter that you have that's telling you to turn the lights off is using more electricity than the lights. Well, it wouldn't surprise me with all the sort of built-in obsolescence that you get into all new technology. I think we're going to have to return to this kind of reuse, recycle type of economy. And um, and I think the the key is really becoming a little bit more self-sufficient and redesigning communities like things like everyone having to live in flats like single parent families not sharing space and sharing resources just sensible planning things but it does seem that we're, we're in such a sort of chaotic mess 
that there's no point to sit down on and set it all out clearly again you know um i think that i think that we need to sort of disentangle ourselves from this and perhaps something like a kind of blackout crisis or an energy crisis might might be the trigger for it because you do wonder like how far can people be pushed nowadays in our country that is not used to war or fighting or you know mass demonstrations smashing stuff up how far can we be pushed in terms of your electricity bills are like three thousand pounds now six thousand pounds now before people really do any like really do anything that makes a difference and i think there around there lies the problem that you know if you do do something and cause a revolution of course the whole word re world re word revolution is you come back to where you started from um and the difficulty the really is difficulties because if as, as greg says in his article it's very very true that we we are totally dependent upon the power we need to do even what we're doing now you know that without power all the devices we have that we have become so dependent upon are suddenly not available even our kindles that we read on now we're going to go have to go back to books you know and of course and i think greg i think you said in the article or i read somewhere else but i think maybe it was you greg that said you know the, the tangible feel of a book is a totally different experience oh that's right you made the points about writing weren't you saying about we'd be divorced from writing which could you talk about that because i thought it was a brilliant point well um i'd have to read back to remind myself of exactly what i said but but yeah it, anything physical is, is obviously quite different from something virtual and you know reading online as we know we're on a kindle has problems in itself because of, of light uh you know light being beamed into your eyes constantly it's not good for you particularly that light in, in those sorts of frequencies um physically writing uh is is very powerful in, a, in ways that are not immediately obvious and maybe not relevant in terms of writing a shopping list or something like that but when you look into the 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 art of uh, Mitch Horowitz could talk to you about this in terms of new thought manifestation, using your intent, your focused will and intent to affect your environment, to affect your experience, which we all do, whether we realize it or not. So best to get in control of that because you're doing it anyway. Um, even if you can only have a three, four, five percent effect on the outcome, it's worth thinking about what, you, what energy you're putting out there and writing things down is an important part of that. You get any book, I've never read The Secret, but you get any sort of pop book like that about uh, changing your reality. And again, a lot of crap has been written in that area, a lot, which misunderstands the potential mechanisms for this, but they'll always say, write things down, get a dream diary, you know, write down what it is you want. And I knew from years of being a writer that just simply writing something whether it's a letter or an article, they often talk about put your thoughts down. Write, the act of writing things down really makes you think about what you think. I know there's been plenty of times when I've started to write an article and I've got to the end of a couple of sentences and said, is that actually what I think? And I thought, no, I need to tweak that because that's not exactly what I mean. But by putting it down on the screen or on the page, it became clear then. So I think that writing things down, something that we don't really do anymore is potentially very, very powerful. And if you look into what, generally gets called magic, which is just another form of manifesting. What is a big part of that? Writing things down, you know, spells, as we said back in the day, writing things down and burning the piece of paper, writing it down, burying it, writing it down, sending it to someone, you know. Remember how much more powerful it used to be pre-internet to write someone a love letter, you know, that, what that actually meant, you know, the energy that went into that. I did it a few times when I was younger, you know. And that just became so, and you'd embellish it with symbols and things. So I, I think that's an important, um, important part, whether you take writing a shopping list or writing a love letter or writing down uh, what it is you really think about something, what it is you really want. Because not only does writing things down force you to think about what you think, it makes you think about what you want. You know, they'll quite often say if you're beginning to, uh, you know, even a psychotherapist might do this, I don't know. But you might say to someone who's troubled in some way or lost, unfocused, drifting, had a bad experience. OK, we're going to write down what it is. You know, that experience, how did that make you feel? Write it down. How would you like to feel? Write it down. So just in a nutshell, there, there's something very powerful there that I think um, in our technological 
you know, 24 seven matrix we find ourselves in that we lose. And by the way, I'm not immune to this. Um, these days for years, actually, I do keep notebooks when I'm reading books. So I'm like yours, I've got a physical copy. I'll read that and I'll write notes in a notebook. Uh, for years, I've used block capitals because my joined up writing became illegible even to me because I was so, I use it so seldom. So now I write in block capitals. That's, that's fascinating in that I, I couldn't help but smile when you mentioned about keeping letters and writing letters. I have every single letter that any girlfriend has ever written to me since I was 14. And I've got them all upstairs and I, I've kept them all and I reread them. And it's something tangible about holding them and, and knowing what date you receive them. And I think when you're writing something down, You've got you've got to think more about what you're going to write because you can't go back. Whereas if you're on a word processor or something, you can always rewrite it. And also, you know, these days you've got things that can spell check and will structure it for you and everything else. But there's not the same kind of direct relationship, the pen and paper. And rather like yourself, I mean, I've printed for years for exactly the same reason. And I've got notebooks everywhere. You know, I, I like taking notes of things because i feel that by writing something down it seems to go into your your brain better doesn't it it seems to become part of you more there's a kind of a direct relationship between you whereas when you're typing something it's not quite the same and that makes you realize and again in one of your articles you said this you know that that, that relationship has been broken the ability to differentiate fact from fiction has been broken by and, and younger people but it's also as you said you know it's just the, the kind of the the way we're looking at screens all the time we'll become very screen dependent you know and we all do it i mean i was noticing you know with the queen's funeral and the things that are going on with the queen the amount of people who are not actually interfacing with what's really happening but they're filming it as if filming it means you capture it and you own it in some way and we're all fearful of this. And I remember this first starting when I first got a video camera in the late 1980s. And I was filming everything, but I wasn't actually in it. I was always behind the camera. Um, it's funny, isn't it, how our world is changing us. And has any of your guests or you any ideas of where you think this might end up? Where, 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 where the ultimate ending of this might be? Well, I think that it... Um... I'm not sure that there's not, I don't think there's going to be a, a singularity, for example, or a single end point. I think it's going to be, it's already fragmented and it will continue to fragment and fracture. Um, there's so many elements at play here, not just technology, but, um, you know, in terms of uh, you know, identity and what, what's at the root of our, our future of our species is human relationships, really, at the end of the day. Um, having some kind of uh, sustainable, you know, infrastructure and and, um, and a certain level of, of lifestyle that allows us to to, to be, do more than just survive. But the threat I see, um, and again, it's being fueled by many different um, aspects in many different directions, is this uh, our interactions with each other, our ability to relate to each other and even to ourselves. And... Um, ability to deal with um, emotions and to deal with personal problems and interpersonal problems. All of that I see being really, really um, uh, derogated by the influence of technology. And again, we shouldn't have to say this, but there have been so many benefits um, from information technology, not least of which those which we're benefiting from right now. That's fine. But there's often a the downside to these things. You know, for example, Alcohol can be good fun, it can be poison, it can kill you. Food can, you know, it's just, it's part of life. One of the best things being alive, it can become a massive problem. Um, sex can be, you know, just, I mean, it's just one of these fundamental things in life, physical relationships. It can become a huge dysfunctional, you know, psychophysical problem for people. So um, there's always a downside to every, you know, to every positive, basically. But that in terms of our relationships, that's the problem I see. And again, that's on the individual level and also collective level, interpersonal, between different groups and organizations, between different countries. It's our um, what Steiner called the war of all against all, which he foresaw. And that's what it feels like at the minute, everyone against everyone. And 
to touch upon something I mentioned in our sort of chats before this session, I think that in terms of consciousness research, the stuff that uh, you're very engaged with and, um, you know, which your latest work is, is really trying to get to grips with scientifically, I think that these exciting revelations and discoveries, whether it is consciousness research, whether it's quantum physics and the nexus between the two, it's not generally being reported in a way that's reaching the mainstream, you know, a, a very large number of people. And it's not being integrated into our daily lives. It's like people I meet uh, in the course of my work sometimes who call themselves Christians and some of the most offensive, rudest um, people, you know, that you could ever meet. So it's like, what would Jesus do? Yeah, he would treat other people like that. No, you're not integrating the Christian teachings into your life. So I think if we can continue to try and live the lessons of that are emerging again and transforming and who knows where all this is going but i think there's already enough emerging to suggest that um everything is fundamentally connected i'm not completely separate from either of you guys i cannot be in fact we're intimately interconnected and what i do ultimately affects you guys and vice versa well what we do affects everything around us is like when you look at um it's best characterized i think in the matrix you know when you see those scenes where uh they see everything being reduced to binary code. What quantum physics tells us at a certain level, then Anthony and Sarah and Greg and all the furniture and bits and bobs you can see in the rooms here, it's all the same stuff. You know, that's one thing that I was revealed to me uh, the first time I took LSD or, or uh, uh, psychedelic psychoactive mushrooms, where like, I saw the space I was in, uh, the carpet, the curtains, the television, the cat, all bristling and resonating and vibrating with exactly the same stuff there was a continuum and i saw it in my own body and the cat it was all one continuum so again integrating the, those ideas and say well what does that mean practically a lot of people still see this as very abstract oh it's intellectually interesting but it doesn't have any it doesn't mean anything what how do i how, do, how does that affect when i go to work it changes everything i think potentially I think you're absolutely spot on there. You know, the idea that when you break it down, everything is just made up of six different type of quarks and electrons in fields. And that effectively is it. And all the magic that we see within the universe is just aggregates of these. And it's one of the things when I was very young, I always used to wonder, where does the wetness of water come from? You know, effectively, you take hydrogen and you take oxygen you know and you, you put two uh, atoms of hydrogen which is a very different substance and you add to that one one atom of oxygen and you put them in a particular configuration and you get water which is a very different substance it's as if things kind of become into things but they're almost epiphenomenon of them so when we try to understand how because effectively you, me and everybody else, if we take the materialist reductionist worldview, you know, even our brain processes can be reduced down to relationships between subatomic particles. But these particles, are, you know, are all part of a greater something and a broader something. So we are effectively all the unity in many, many ways. And there's this perception of distance or this perception of apartness is an illusion. And of course, what does that is time and space. Space keeps us in a distance between other people and other entities. And time takes us from slices in time. But there's more to this, isn't there? You know, and it's I think why the point you made there about quantum mechanics and quantum physics, I think there's been an awful lot of disservice done to quantum mechanics and quantum physics by a lot of writers who jump too far with them. You know, the, the Deepak Chopra approach, you know, where, you know, you use them too far too much. But I think this is the fear as to why the general public are blissfully unaware of quantum physics and quantum mechanics. And they're stuck in the science of 130 years ago. And it's because it is so revolutionary in its implications that the powers that be, whoever the powers that be want, don't want people to necessarily be aware of this. And on this, I'm re remembering... There was a book written called um, Quantum Enigma many years ago by Rosenblum and Kuttner. 
And Rosenblum was a professor in um, physics at one of the universities in, in Los Angeles, California, I think somewhere. But he was told when the book first started, when they were writing the book, the, the associate professors turned around and said, you really, this is not what you should be doing because this is going to be dangerous. It's like giving a bomb or fireworks to children. But we know that this is the only way that people kind of really understand exactly how we link to everybody else. And I think work like what you're doing, like which what you're doing, I sounded like Morecambe and Wise there, didn't I? Is, is so important because you're allowing people the, the platform to, to, to say these things. But I think what's important about this show here is whenever we've met, I've always been fascinated by your ideas and we've always had a discussion rather than an interview. And I think this is what this is developing into now. It's an exchange of ideas. When you were here, you know, we were talking about the interface that you have online to the interface you have when you're sitting in front of each other. It's a very different thing, isn't it? The dynamic is different. And Sarah and I have discussed this, you know, in the past that it's much better to do interviews like this when all three of you are sitting round or four of you or five of you. Um, so one of the things that... What what are the things that are exciting you now about um, the things you're discovering and the things you're finding? What is the thing that is 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 in what B is in Greg's bonnet at the moment? What are the things that really excite you and really disturb you? Okay, I'll just break briefly for a word from our sponsor. Uh, this is a uh, oh, that you were talking. Wow! About. Well, so, how did you? Where was that? Was that on your desk or something? They're just sitting next to me. Yeah. <laughs> wow now that is an example of resonance what is the chances of me mentioning a book and it's on your desk exactly. and, it's got, it's, and it's a new edition i note well that's the that's the one i got when it came out so i don't know it, there might have been an earlier edition anyway uh you can find an interview with fred cutner at legalizefreedom.com so really so you've yeah. interviewed fred cutner yeah yeah i remember yeah, it was quite a few when this came out yeah. Wow, what a guy to meet. <laughs> so um, what, one thing that's interesting, me, in, in relation to what we've been talking about, about integrating this knowledge, this insight, this information, is um, that there's, there's clearly something dark going on, isn't there? Let's just say that in the world at the moment. And I think that it isn't, all, it isn't necessarily all available to us or visible on the surface. There are other things going on. Now, I sent you a video that I did, which mainly was so I could remember to refer uh, it to uh, viewers here who might like to check it out. And it was something I was trying to articulate some a collection of thoughts I'd had in recent years. Uh, the video you can find, um, again, legalizefreedom.com or Legalize Freedom 1 on YouTube. And the title is, Are Humans Being Harvested? Question mark. And in that, I was trying to address um, a, a sort of some kind of dark, non-material, psycho-spiritual influence, something, whether it's like a force or entities, there's something going on beneath the surface of the 3D five sense reality that does not have our best interests at heart, maybe quite the contrary. It's not that the, the universe is, um, does not care, it has no feelings about uh, the human race, good or bad. There seems to be an element, a dimension of something going on that is attacking us or undermining us, um, jealous of us, seeking to possess us. I don't know what it is. And again, this starts to now sound like the most out there kind of occult stuff, but you just have to bear with me on this. The events of recent decades, but certainly the events of the last two years, made it clear to me, crystallized the idea that, and I'd say this to everyone watching, whatever you think, about whatever your cosmology is, whatever your view of reality, whatever you think about the events of the last two or three years, it seems clear to me and it should be clear to you. There is some force, some entity, some thing that wants large numbers of human being dead. That seems certain. And exploring this, these dimensions, these possibilities are kind of, which one thing it's taking up a lot of my uh, mental bandwidth at the minute. Um, and we've, we've certainly talked about our chronic influence, haven't we, before? Mm -hmm. And the only reason we ended up at your house because we couldn't get the bloody technology to work. <laughs> we, couldn't yep. the, we couldn't get the atomic technology to work, so we had to go for resonance technology, which involves sitting around a table. Um, and in people I've interviewed, uh, Paul Levy, 
him of the uh, Watiko. Uh, mm. He's very good on this. I'll be having him back on again very soon. And another guy called Jason Horsley, J A S U N. I know, I know both of them. I know Jake very well. I've met up Jake on quite a few occasions. I yeah, want I mean, to interview him again. He's just endlessly interesting, isn't he? And the, the oh take, yeah. The take that he has and where we are in terms of like, you know, uh, mind matter and what what entities, what beings there are in whatever dimension of reality besides the, the sort that we perceive is absolutely fascinating. So this might seem like a a real 90 degree turn from us talking about uh, consciousness research and quantum physics. But I, I see the two of them as having a, a lot of crossover, a lot of sort of relevance to each other. Well, it's interesting, this sort of hierarchy we have of consciousness in a way though, isn't it? Like this idea that human consciousness is at the top and there's nothing beyond that. And I kind of think if you view consciousness as more of a kind of web of living things, then, like seagulls. <laughs> can you hear them? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're kind of going crazy. After we've had all the rains, you can just see loads because there's so much avian flu around here. There's like just birds and bones all over the pavements after oh. the heavy rain. But um, but yeah, I do think that human intelligence is perhaps something that we've created the idea of ourselves and maybe our ancestors saw themselves as being more of a part of a living consciousness of the planet and the cosmos and um, I wonder whether we might return to something like that because I kind of think that human beings need belief systems of some sort and with um, you know in the west not in other parts of the world obviously but in the west we're kind of deciding that we don't believe in god and we believe in science instead or we, we don't believe in sort of higher powers but I think there's something that something about believing in higher powers that brings a kind of cohesion to life on Earth in some in some way. Although obviously it can be horribly manipulated and can be controlled by egomaniacs and all these kinds of things as well. But I think we're we're part of a we're part of consciousness, and I don't think human beings are the only we have a kind of monopoly over consciousness at all. I think it was very interesting that we we're talking here about Jake Horsley because um, Jake wrote an amazing book a few years ago called Homo Serpiens. He has another um, non, non de plume, which is Aeolius Kifas. And Jake and I have met on a, quite a few occasions. And I remember Jake, I met up with him and his girlfriend ooh, about 15 years ago at Euston Station. And I remember him warning me and turning around and saying that I need to be very, very careful because they know about me. <laughs> was the term he used and he needs to be very careful uh, because I, as I start to shake the trees it's going to be noticed and I needed to be careful which which I found quite interesting so when I make these running jokes about the archons but it does happen a lot because Greg and I really really I mean it's not just with Greg but it's, it's other people as well there's always problems with technology that we have but Greg and I had real difficulties trying to get that show together. So going on about Greg, so what do you think? I mean, you know, I've written about the concept of the egregorial again, <laughs> the, the egregores, the Gregories. So maybe <laughs> we, should, we, should, we should talk about the Gregories rather than the egregorials. And of course, I keep thinking about Gregory's Girl, one of my favourite movies, but that's another aside, really. So Greg, what do, you, what do you think? Have you any ideas as to what you think the manipulators might be and what might be going on? No. <laughs> right. Uh, well, nothing conclusive. Um, but, and I've had so few negative experiences um, in my life. Um, when I say negative experience, I'm not talking about the type we have, you know, like mental events, psychological events, whether it's, uh, you know, some kind of disturbance as a result of, of something out there in the physical world or something that's just coming from within yourself. You know, I've been blessed that way in life is to always felt emotionally, mentally very stable and at ease with, um, with everything really, you know, it's uh, never really get troubled at a deep level uh, uh, if, about things. If, if I am troubled, then I always am I'm the observer of that. If you know what I mean? I realize it's not me. Um, but I, I see it manifest in the world around me. And unfortunately, there's millions, billions of people all over this planet who are in a very poor state psychologically, mentally. Uh, that doesn't mean they're not functioning. But 
uh, as a species, we are deeply, deeply troubled. Um, part of that, um, we could go off on a whole other thread here, as I have done in the past, I think maybe leaked species trauma, possibly uh, going back to, again, the antediluvian period, pre-flood, pre-ice age, something really, really terrible happened in the past. And to use Rupert Sheldrick's idea of morphic resonance, that we're still dealing with it, encapsulated for me in the first time, again, just because they're sat here in the books of um, Emmanuel Velikovsky. Again, <laughs> Worlds people, in Collision, yeah. Criticised him, you know, but this is where I first got into this, uh, earth and upheaval, mm -hmm. we got worlds in collision. collision. I've got exactly that copy. <laughs> and this, this sums up what, what I'm talking about. Mankind in amnesia. What is it, that one. What is it that we're suppressing? What have we buried in the collective psyche? There's Jungian uh, concepts coming in here. What are we pushing down? Uh, so that's one angle of inquiry in terms of like where we are as a species. But the other is, as I've mentioned, that there's some kind of um, force out there that does not have our best interest at heart, at heart quite the contrary. Um, Jason Horsey and I did this in a talk called What If Most People Out There in the World Are Not Like Us? And this is where I also talked about this with Mark Stavish, he's a senior Freemason, occultist, esotericist over in the US. His book, The Egregores, is one of the books on the subject. The, the, con the, the central theme of all of that being there are more bodies on the earth than there are souls. So, and I, when we, when Jason and I talked about this, I said, this sounds so elitist. This is really, really pushing people's buttons here. Mm. I feel bad even saying this. Are we looking at uh, invasion of the body snatchers type thing where only one in 10 of us or something, or even less, um, is, is it human as we think of ourselves? If so, what, what are the others? Because certainly, I don't know if you guys have had this experience or are ready to admit to this experience of encountering other uh, humanoid forms on the planet and just thinking, that, that's, what is that? That's, that's alien to me, you know? I've, so I've certainly struggled with like small talk and being bored and, um, you know, so I, I mean, I have that, I have definitely experienced the energy vampire situation. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't know if that's ever been to the extent we began to wonder if this was a different form of life form. But I certainly, that's crossed my mind. And I, I had a brainwave, uh, I should say a brainstorm. I always think of a brainwave as like a good idea that comes to you. A brainstorm more as like something that not necessarily good or bad, it just appears forcefully at the front of your consciousness. When I was doing a talk the other week, it was a round table thing, a few of us, and the Georgia Guidestones had just been um, bombed. Uh, so we were talking about that and we also were talking about what we're talking about now the, the sarconic influence and in other entities and i said on the guidestones it said maintain the population at 500 million you know the human population i said i wonder is that the number of actual humans that are and that's what that refers to that you can have 9 10 billion but 500 million are human and the rest are well yet to be determined I, I think one of the areas here I find rather worrying about this is if you start to think that other people aren't human, that, that that's then, you know, it's moving towards almost genocide, because if they're not human, you can categorize them as being non-human. And I'm thinking, you know, with the, you know, the, the, the treatment of the Jews in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. But. I, I take your point to a degree. I mean, in that um, I once, many years ago, um, I was at a party in, in South London. And at the party, I was introduced to this, this guy. And it's the only time that I've met somebody that absolutely terrified me. And he had absolutely dead eyes. And I cannot describe it any other way, but there was no life in his eyes it was like lizard eyes i'm not I'm not, you know, I'm not into david ike so please don't even put me in that category because that's that's crazy stuff but there was something about this guy that was different and i got talking to the host next day about who that guy was and i discovered he was a contract killer of the most brutal kind he used to talk this guy was known for torturing people to death okay and i'd met him and interfaced with him 
And I just knew there was something different. Now, I'd argue it's probably the kind of stuff that Thomas Sheridan writes about. You know, the idea of there are some people that literally have no empathy. They don't empathize. They don't project themselves outwards to understand the the existence of the other in some way. The psychopath, isn't it? Basically, it's the psychopath. Yeah. I will just say I understand what I what I was saying there a moment ago can be viewed, um, and it is a very controversial type of statement. I do understand that, but I was simply just being honest and to say that's the conversation mm-hmm. Jason and I had, and we were both I quite disturbed by this. But we're just grappling with ideas because, after all, it's legalized freedom. If you can't go places where other people won't go, mm-hmm. there, of course. You know, I think that that's. I think you're absolutely right. It's so important that everyone's able to talk to one another and i think that's what's missing from our culture at the moment is dialogue between people that don't necessarily agree with one another and and coming to new you know coming towards new ideas and things i mean i think this also ties in with what you were saying about technology because i think there's a risk with excessive use of technology of um disassociation and to me a lot of the kind of zombification of people is to do with this disassociation which is caused by using technology and living sort of through the internet and forgetting about your experience of a as a human being within the world and lacking embodiment and so many of the issues that people have with anxiety depression and all kinds of things is is a result of not living an embodied life, connecting with other people, talking with other people, developing good interpersonal relationships, connecting with nature, and all to do with living mentally, projecting yourself mentally into um, into the technology as a, as a sort of mental avatar rather than a real living human being. Yeah, disassociation, that's key. You would have had someone like Jung talk using that word, you know, 100 years ago. Um, it is incredibly relevant. Um, and then that's what we're seeing, you know, an epidemic of disassociation at the moment. Mm. <clears throat> and that affects, um, I know, how people relate to each other. And the, it's, the disassociation is embodied in the kind of remote technology that we're using now. Uh, we do meet and interact with other people, but a lot of people don't. Um, where I see it most, uh, well, in one of the ways it's most pronounced, I mentioned earlier about people's inability to have relationships and just interact normally. And I see this with quite a lot of not just younger people, but predominantly younger people, um, is there the social awkwardness, you know, the inability to do the most basic things. And as we have this phenomenon now of, uh, and not just for socioeconomic reasons, but, you know, people of like age 30 and up still living at home with their parents sort of thing. They get, you get the, in Japan, you've had the longstanding phenomenon of the hikikomori, 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 I can't remember how it's pronounced, but if you type in Japan and sort of, you know, uh, start H I double K, it should fill in the rest for you. But that's a, a, a social phenomenon there of predominantly young men, um, completely socially inept, now, no jobs. They generally have never left the family home at all. And they're looking at getting to a certain point uh, where they'll never be able to gain, never mind regain function as, you know, in, ter- in societal terms. Uh, you know, to be out and live life on their own and might have a family or whatever it is they want to do, have a career. And uh, I see that <clears throat> now sort of catching up um, t- with us here in, in Western Europe and in North America. And of course, uh, again, not limited by any means to North America, but seems to be most pronounced there. You have the related phenomenon of the incel, I-N-C-E-L, the involuntary, involuntary celibate, another disturbing trend that I see aggravated very much by the internet in terms of atomizing people, a dissociation, and also the prevalence of pornography. Um, again, that's another whole debate, but it's one of the um, things, the things that's come to dominate the internet, which I see. And again, adults do what you want. Pornography has been long been part of um, sexual expression, you know, in, in humans. You see, going back to cave paintings. Um, but we saw in Victorian times what distorted sexual drives can do. Uh, mm. to and I think you're seeing that now and where the produ- prevalence of pornography is already preventing and may in some individuals' cases completely prevent them ever having a normal physical relationship with other human beings on those terms. So, yeah, but Sarah's dissociation word is really, really important. And no matter what all the other 
humanoid forms on the earth are. Maybe they are exactly like you and I, maybe they're not. Functionally, they're not. And just to backtrack a little bit to your comment about the, the Nazi Holocaust, how I would view that in, in those terms, in Jason Horty sort of terms, is uh, the, the Jewish and other minorities um, who were sent to the death camps and sometimes murdered and sometimes just kept in terrible depravity for years, you know, and scarred them for life as human beings, and the Nazis as another load of human beings led by entities, at the very least psychopathic entities, but again, mm-hmm. something that you and I would not recognise as, as human beings like us. Yeah, I think that's a very valid point, you know, when you think about the the, the mental state of people when they have total power, like the, I mean, I, I read recently a book on, on the occult and, and Nazism, and it was quite interesting, again, you know, the way in which they had these incredible extreme beliefs, the Ultima Thule groups and, and other groups, in terms of the the, 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 the the world of ice and fire. And you realise that it's very difficult once people start to believe in strange things. And you're noticing this now, that the, the way in which the New Age movement is morphing into being much more fascist-like, and it's moving into this kind of um, individuals that are becoming cult leaders almost. And it, you can see it changing. You know, the idea I see so many times on Facebook, these people going on about being empaths and how difficult it is being an empath. And you think you're not being an empath. You're being completely the opposite. You're being totally self-centered in the way you're seeing the world. And as you say in your essays and things, you know, it's as if the technology here is driving us towards this. There's obviously the the destruction of of certain sexual urges through the the ease of pornography. So we've got that problem as well. But on top of that, if you're saying that there's this this like Wetico idea, you know, the Paul Levy concept, and Paul was on this show a few months ago, like it was actually last year, it was almost exactly a year ago. And again, it's the same idea that are there other entities that are actually either being manifested by ourselves or they are something that is dangerous to us or antithetical to us and in this i'm i'm reminded of um something again that sir and i have discussed and, and other members of my group have discussed this idea of the hungry ghosts this idea you know of the joe fisher concept of the way in which there seems to be entities that come through during medium things and everything else that seem to have very negative attitudes towards human beings or could it just be that it's part of our own collective fears and we manifest these collective fears and they become part of us in some way because you know your point your very valid point before you know that we're all one single entity experiencing itself subjectively you know the idea that we are a singularity experiencing itself and it's it's very we're in very disturbing times, you know. And I just feel that society could go into some. And as soon as we've got over this hypnotized, hypnotized stage at the moment with the death of the Queen, you know, once that's all gone, once that's all over, is that going to be a unification for people, or is it going to be the opposite? Is it going to change people's attitudes? You know, we've got new prime minister, we've got a new king. It's as if the change is happening so rapidly that all the old things that you believed in are just eroding around us, aren't they? It, it's quite scary. Quick um, mention, just to, again, backtrack very slightly, because I happen to be sitting next to me. Uh, this book. Uh, oh, Vril. Vril. Oh, Bull with the Bullwood Lizard. Uh, yeah, because the Vril was very much central to a lot of the, the German belief systems yeah, and everything some, else, the Vril. Yeah, Bullwood Lizard. Some, some of the occult ideas that the Nazis had, uh, and you can overstate the Nazi occult thing, but it was real. So certain members of the high command had very deep interest, but this novel was very influential. It, it involved a master race, or at least superior race, of uh, humans living in uh, the centre of the earth, and it was accessed, this world could be accessed only somewhere um, in the, you know, the, the tundra of wastes near the North Pole or the Arctic Circle. And, uh, and this and this came out interestingly enough, didn't it? The whole concept of that came out in the Shaver mystery, in ufology. You know, the idea of the Deros and the demented robots that that that, that was very much again the idea of these Cthulhuic creatures that are below the ground that come up that are, are dangerous or they're a master race. And of course, we've got the you know you go back to the master races of the writings of people like Blavatsky. 
You know, it's again the idea of that there are ascended masters somewhere or the superior human beings. And we are just on the surface of something that's far more complex. You know, um, it's very intriguing, but also quite dangerous in many ways, I think. Um, but there might be something more, you know, you know, your point, you know, that are we food for something else? You know, there is the argument to say, you know, that energy, human vitality, organ energy, if we want to actually use the term, you know, that that's been used in esoteric traditions for many, many years. Do these entities feed upon that in some way? Um, throwing it open to both of you, really, in terms of that as a conversation point. Well, I took it. I took this in the direction uh, <clears throat> away from consciousness studies and quantum physics into this idea of other entities and other forces. Um, but what you just highlighted, it, very salient here potentially. Um, you know, is that self-generated? Are, it, it, are the entities that we encounter in dreams things that seem to other beings that we maybe even encounter in real life that seem alien to us? Um, the creatures that appear um, sometimes very malevolent in psychedelic experiences, particularly you know, documented by researchers um, like Christopher Bache, who's dedicated most of his life to high dose LSD and some of the terrifying things he's been through. Um, he, he said that these entities appear to be objectively real, separate from us, but is it all somehow internally generated? Is it all a bit like the id monster in Forbidden Planet? If you remember that, you know, the, mm, the, the, yes. the relationship between the, the science fiction film, the relationship between the father and daughter, the tension there, you know, even the sort of sexual tension. I don't mean it in, in terms of like, uh, you know, uh, incest. I don't mean it like that. Mm. But these tensions, primal tensions, giving rise to something which manifested itself physically in the film. So there's that to look at as well, because it, we do appear to be part of one continuum in terms of you know the base level of reality well we're, even if consciousness is somewhere below that but base level of reality as where it's being revealed to us with our um scientific instruments it does appear to be one continuum so but does that allow for these other experiences that does that allow for death and destruction um and evil and i've done a mm -hmm. couple of people talking about the nature of evil and i think it's um i i, I think it, it is a thing and i think that that in the same way that the Bible tells us, you know, that uh, Satan's greatest um, trick is to have us not believe in Satan, that perhaps in terms of evil, it's for people to dismiss evil as something from medieval times, you know, smacking of, you know, witchcraft and it's all pseudo-religious, but doesn't that, whereas Paul Levy's ideas, they, they would, uh, he, he would definitely counter that and say, no, there is something uh, malevolent out there. Mm. Sir, you and I have discussed in the past, you know, about entities and how much they're projections of people's subconscious when they have DMT experiences and everything else as well. So it'd be interesting to have your angle on this. Well, a lot of what you were saying there kind of reminded me of this idea of the gods, you know, to ancient people, this idea of there being um, psychic or soul phenomena related to either natural phenomena or... Um, different planets different stars and you know i kind of feel like in our in our our culture is just so confused and it does seem that we've kind of blurred fiction and fantasy to an extent that perhaps it's never been blurred before and and things like you know if a population is is mostly part of a religious system they have this shared mythic foundation uh, which acts as a framework for the and a container for their anomalous experiences and their sort of psi phenomena and all this kind of stuff like I've, I've started going to the church opposite me recently and it's really interesting because psi phenomena and parapsychological activity happens there every single week when they meet up someone will have some amazing thing happen to them or some experience of the holy spirit touching them some sensation some sort of spontaneous vision will appear to them but within a context of an organized system and a a, a, a worldview or reality a reality view um those experiences can make sense to that population and i think that because we live in such a sort of fragmented society now we're confused by experiences and we're bombarded by so much information all the time that it's really hard to make sense of everything but i do believe in a living cosmos i believe that 
reality is a living consciousness, a stream of consciousness, and that our, um, our own conscious projections can influence the cosmos in some ways as well. And I, and I do think that, um, you know, like you were saying, Anthony, about this idea of time and space, like our world and our perception of our world and our existence as human beings is, is made possible by our perceptions of time and space and by our existence on a particular planet in a particular point in space. And it's a massive thing to comprehend. I don't think we're ever going to have the answer to it. I think um, the key is to just be like as happy as possible. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what's your thoughts on that? Be as happy as possible. I think that's um, a very good way of putting it, isn't it? I just, it's interesting. I, I, the last time I spoke to Jason Horsley, I uh, mentioned um, happiness, and, and he said, "Why do you think that's even intended for us? You know, why should that even why should that even be a goal? Uh, I don't know if happiness is the same as like um, pain avoidance. It probably isn't. But um, all I would say, yeah, no, I, I, I'm not." picking on what Sarah said and saying I disagree with it as such, but I think all I would say is I think that um, the, a popular perception of happiness, again, can come down to a materialist, materialist reduction mm. of terms and can be literally the embodiment of both senses of the word materialism, one in terms of cosmology, the other in terms of like a lifestyle. And yeah. I think that's, that's why so many people are so discombobulated at the moment, because what they perceive as happiness or the route to happiness, the means for happiness is falling apart around them, you know? And, and yeah. so I mean, that's, that for me is just a very skewed view of happiness though, isn't it? And I think you're totally right. I mean, I always think, you know, when you see uh, people posting on Instagram or Facebook about their amazing lives, I always sort of tend to think, well, they're not, if you're really, really happy in a moment, you're not taking photos of it. You're not, um, you know, so much of it, like you say, is projecting like you need to be rich to be happy. If you look at things like The Secret that you mentioned earlier and the Abraham Hicks thing, nearly every question is about how do I get this boyfriend? How do I get this money? How do I get that? And real happiness is just in the moment appreciating exactly where you are and why well, you know everything about it. So, Well, isn't this the central concept, isn't it, of Buddhism? You know, one of the great things that the Buddha discovered was, you know, what 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 is what makes pain, what makes us unhappy is wanting things, is, is desiring things rather than living in the moment. And I was thinking then about happiness and I was saying that, you know, there's been two or three occasions in my life when I feel, you know, I'm having a Maslowian peak experience where you feel totally, completely and utterly happy. And they're in the most bizarre sets of circumstances. I remember once in a, in a previous relationship driving up the A12 going towards Suffolk for a weekend and singing in the car. And both of us were singing in the car. And that moment was the most magical moment in my life. It was just everything was perfect. And, you know, all the time we get these little glimpses of this. What is what is these experiences that we have? Or it's when sometimes you see a beautiful sunset and these things are intangible. And I think Greg's point is a powerful one that we're so preoccupied with what we own or what we want to own, we miss the beauty of what just being is, you know, being in the moment, you know, the the idea of living in the now, you know, Eckhart Tolle, you know, the, the, the power of now, because all we ever experience is the now. That's all we ever do. You know, the past has gone, supposedly, and the future is yet to be. And all that is, is this moment now. And, and that's very powerful. But if we have this fear that, you know, there's something dark behind that that is a danger and we all know this kind of feeling sometimes of kind of malevolence maybe um i don't tend to, to to see that but i can understand why people do see it and i can you know there is this you know the dark night of the soul you know the saint john of the cross kind of ideas and these must be dark periods in your life where you feel that there's no escape and everything you know and it is it is quite and I would imagine there's a lot of people that are watching or listening to this program out there that are saying no, you know, that they do see the the the, the dangers and the nasty side of the world. And it's very easy for us to, to say it's all light. And of course, you can't see light without darkness. You need the contrast. Don't you? I suppose if you do if you do see these energies as being like either end of a, a pole as well, like perhaps happiness, joy, pleasure is the other side of fear and 
alchemically speaking, the way to combat the, the fear that we're constantly subjected to. And this, you know, if you think about the sort of, especially during Corona, during um, the sort of crises in the world recently when the media has been like stirring everyone up and creating and generating mass fear and hysteria, the, the key is just not engaging and trying to be happy and trying to find things to be appreciative because then it can't latch into us. You know, if you, if you believe that fear is an energy that's a food source, mm. of some higher nefarious entity, then we have to make, make efforts to not produce that source you know it's a bit like um i suppose you know narciss people that talk about narcissism talk about you being uh, a not narcissistic fee a feed for someone who um just wants your attention and and sucks all all of the attention out of you now you talked about you mentioned the word energy vampires <clears throat> a while ago sarah didn't you so that's that's definitely a thing excuse me <clears throat> but whether the idea of harvesting fearful energy whether the idea of entities doing that is is something real, however you want to define that word, or not. It seems self-evident that generating a lot of that sort of energy isn't good for the individual or the collective anyway. So even on the most superficial materialist level, it's not good, never mind at any deeper level. Um, Anthony, you and I talked recently, uh, at our talk we had at your home, um, about uh, Maslow's peak experience. And I, I said I first encountered this um, in uh, Colin Wilson's Faculty X. And mm -hmm. you have these experiences, if you do, if you're fortunate enough to have them, the most random moments. And it isn't necessarily um, in response to elements that you would normally think, oh, well, yeah, this is a happy situation for me. You know, I'm with people I love. We're doing something we all love. Uh, everything's going well. It's not necessarily like that. It can happen at the, the weirdest times. And sometimes I find that it happens at times when you need it, you know, when maybe you've lost sight of, 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 of a wider reality. A deeper reality and you're reminded of it i mean yeah. the, the one i spoke to you about in our talk that people can go back and watch listen to is this it was just involved um a cup of coffee and the sunshine landing on me in a certain way and i was suddenly because of the the the, the sensation of the heat from the sun the taste of the coffee and i suddenly was transported to uh two different places simultaneously where i've been incredibly happy in the past and i was just filled with a sense of well-being only for about 30 seconds, you know, but it transformed my day. I'm still thinking about it, you know. So what is that, you know? Mm -hmm. In terms of materialism and wanting things, I, I'm not going to contradict myself here, but um, I'm with Mitch Horowitz on this. And we talked about this in one of our interviews together, Mitch and I, is that we're maybe we're not of this world, but we're in it. So I think we're here, we are here to engage with the world. This is why you won't find me sitting on top of a, a mountaintop in a monastery uh, meditating. Nothing wrong with that if you want to do that, but I believe we're here to, to act and interact. We're here to engage. And it may be some people have this idea, you know, some spiritual traditions and cosmologies hold the idea that this is some kind of testing ground, proving ground. We've chosen to manifest here. It's not meant to be sweetness and light. It's damn hard. But we've come here for personal growth, collective growth, whatever it is. We're here for a reason. Other people have articulated, I don't agree, that it's some kind of prison planet that we're sent here as some form of punishment, individual or collective. I don't see that. But yes, don't be, do not attach yourself to these material things. But as Mitch might say, there's nothing wrong with wanting nice things. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. But as long as you're not attached to that, you know, I've got a certain number of nice objects in my life that I enjoy, that I like having around, whether they're useful, functional, or whether they're just beautiful. I appreciate that. But if it all goes away, it's like, okay, well, that's fine. It's all going to go away anyway. You know, I'm, I'm not, I can't take it with me. So in that sense, I am a believer in being, in operating in the world on, on different levels because it is a reality of different levels, spiritual, you know, mental, physical. So I would never completely disengage or try to disengage from the physical level. It's only if you get caught up in that, as a lot of people seem to be, unfortunately, believe that's all there is and then and pursue uh, goals that are not actually your own, they're fed to you through advertising or the media or just general uh, wider culture. I think that's the tragedy of life, isn't it? You know, the idea that wanting something and everything's transitory. So whatever you want, be it being in love with somebody or anything else, they're only going to change, they're only going to die or you're going to die. And it's just loss all the time. 
And I, I was reminded of your point there about that kind of peak experience sensation that you described. And I think probably in our discussion, I mentioned this as well, the, the wonderful line by Jakob Bome, when he said, you know, you could go insane just contemplating a pewter dish. And the idea that, you know, sometimes we don't focus in on the, the, the beauty of the things around us, you know, a leaf or that feeling of, of, of magical something. And it was, again, I think it was Peter Ospensky that said he had this amazing experience when he was sailing on the Sea of Azov, when suddenly he just was looking at the cliffs and the seagulls and the sea, and he had this at one moment, you know, where, where everything was just, he realised he was part of everything else. And when you get that feeling, you get that kind of shiver up your spine and you realise that you're in the right place at the right moment for the right time. But we've had recently, you know, such, and I think Sarah's point is such a valid one, that we have this, you know, the news is always bad. It's always as if they're making us fearful of the next big thing. It just seems it's ratcheting up, isn't it? You know, we get told this and then something even more happens. But if we didn't know about these things, you know, if we were medieval peasants or, or people living in the 16th, 17th century, you know, the 30 years war was kicking off in Europe. But, you know, if you were a peasant up in Cumbria, the horrific things that were happening in Munster and places like that wouldn't matter because you wouldn't know about them. So it's almost because we have all this information that we fear fear itself. We we anticipate all the terrible things that can happen. And I've always found in my life it, they've never happened. You know, you fear. I remember as a kid, you know, the fear of my family over the the, the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis and the tangible fear of that. And I could sense it. But we survive, don't we? We we go through it. But it's what, you know, if there's more to the world than we think it is, it's a more, far more fascinating place, but also a far more disturbing place. I don't know. It can be. Yeah. But see, seeing the world as it actually is, um, it can be disturbing. Again, this is why, even though it's, it's well-worn and quite hackneyed references to the Matrix, the movie, but again, when the, the, the experience that the, those who become unplugged go through when they see the world as it is, either it sends them into sort of you know, spiral, downward spiral of mental illness, or it is ultimately liberating, you know? And that's what I am kind of striving for. And I don't know what sense of revelation or insight we'll be able to have in this physical life, but is to see the world as it actually is. And I don't think that's for us. Uh, is there, in, in mm. these bodies, I don't think that's intended um, at all. But um, I made a, a number of videos over the lockdown period in response to what was happening. Uh, one of them was called, uh, all these are still up. Uh, one of them was called Stop Watching the News, which you could sing actually to the, the, the tune of, uh, um, what's it called? New York, New York. Yeah, you can sing. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I stopped watching the news. I, I only ever paid attention to mainstream news prior to that because I wanted to know what people I would encounter day to day, what, where they were getting their information, what information they were getting. Because I knew that most people got their information from nightly news, radio, TV, internet. So I just wanted to be aware of the bullet points, what's currently circulating in the mass consciousness. I stopped on March the 17th, 2020, St. Patrick's Day, coincidentally, um, because I could see where things were going. And I haven't turned on television or radio uh, or looked at any form of news since then. Now, the result is, do I feel disconnected, out of touch with world events? No, I don't. Because just by osmosis from acting and interacting in the world, things come to you. They find their way to you. Sometimes they're not relevant. But anything that I've since judged that I would have needed or wanted to know about found its way to me anyway. And it's been the best thing, I've, one of the best things I've ever done was just to cut that out. And um, I thoroughly recommend it. Try it, see what happens. Like some kind I of- haven't, I haven't had a newspaper or watched the news for about 15 years. <laughs> 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 my, my mum and dad are sort of horrified by it. But yeah, I remember watching EastEnders in the early nineties. And that was about the last time that I um, bothered with any of that sort of stuff because the fear mongering even the EastEnders makes me feel sick it's like so fear mongery 
and um, news is sort of hysterical. Like I do like, I, li I really like those comedies that take the mickey out of how stupid and um, sort of purposefully designed the news and TV programs are to make you feel panicky. Like the way they use dramatic music or just the way they talk, the way they present the news. The best, best film for that was it was the day to day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, remember. I love, I love all those kinds of things. Yeah, um, and I love like Vic and Bob always do a really good job of taking the Mickey out of like the way media and the way um, culture presents itself. There's definitely like a style, and um, it's like massively powerful. And you, you definitely, I've been so much less bothered and fearful about stuff. And I didn't watch news during the coronavirus thing at all, you know. So in my, in my world that I didn't see people dying all around me I, I, it just there wasn't evidence of that for me you know I didn't witness that um and obviously I live in a small town so it's a bit different as well I feel sorry for people that lived in big towns or in tower blocks or or things where it was obviously like much stricter in Hastings people were just outside sitting on the beach watching the sunrise and the sunset and I thought it was an incredible thing and one of the things that really struck me about it was how quiet it was because there wasn't this constant noise pollution that you usually get. And people had this great appreciation for how quiet it was. There were more animals, more birdsong, more fish even swimming in the sea. It was incredible. But um, but yeah, I, I, I'm a big fan of not bothering with the news. I mean, you look at news articles as well. They're so badly written often and not informative, only telling one side of the story. Like you say, Anthony, if you want to find anything out for yourself, you just look it up and you'll find out exactly what you want. And you can search for the opposite of that as well and see if you can find that. So I think that we have this incredible access to information these days through technology. And I, as you know, I'm a Trekkie. And in Star Trek, they use technology to find things out and for useful purposes, you know, useful purposes. And it's not used as a sort of distraction and it's not um, a brain drain in the way it can be for us now. But I think it has the potential. We can definitely use it. It's just a conscious decision that you make to use technology for good and not bad, like all things. I think you reminded me there and I was thinking again when I've been at my most happiest and um, it used to, you know, Greece in the 1970s when, you know, you'd find an obscure island somewhere and you'd just sleep on the beach and you had no newspapers, no radio, you know, the new, you, you couldn't get newspapers on a lot of the smaller Greek islands, only on the major ones. And even then it was three days late and you just were in this kind of almost peasant like worldview. You know, that all that mattered was your evening meal and your company and the sun and the weather. And that was it. And that to me is just perfection. That's all we need. All we need is friends, our loved ones around us. And that's it. And food in our stomach. And that's all we need. Everything else is not needed. So all this fear mongering and everything else, you know, is beside the point. I mean, I found now as I'm getting older, you know, I'm looking back on my life and thinking about what it's all about, because, you know, you're looking back along the long road, going off into the distance of where you started and you realize that there is a point to it. And it's, it's learning. It's you learning, you discovering yourself and what it is to be you. Yeah, I think I'm, you know. rather than gaining material stuff or, you know, because I've got so many friends who've got houses, mortgages, I don't have any of those things. I haven't got a car. I'm practically useless in the modern world, but I am happy. And my, the one thing my dad ever said to me that was like a compliment was, I have to admit, you are the happiest one of my kids. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's about soul enrichment, isn't it? And, and the more rich you feel your inner world and the more happy then you feel about not wasting your life and and actually getting something of it. And I think, Tony, you're so right about friends and being feeling loved, loving other people and being inspired, I think is my favourite thing and, and appreciating beauty. I think that's the magic of our little group that we have. I mean, I think that, you know, that, that's the, the wonderful thing. And that's why I'm so looking forward to our get together in Brighton next week, which is going to be um, the week after. It's going to be really good. So, Greg, we're getting towards, you know, we've got the last few minutes. What topics would you, for the last 10 minutes, are there are any kind of bees in your bonnet that you'd like to discuss or things that you're planning for the future or whatever? Um, then tell everybody what you're going to be doing. Well, I don't have my list of forthcoming guests to hand, um, but one thing that 
I, in general, I'm planning to do is I really do want to ramp up the output, you know, just in terms of volume, um, because I, I've been, I get such good feedback. Um, no, sometimes I get negative feedback as well, but I'm getting feedback. I'm finding quite simply, as you might imagine, the more you put in, the more you get out. So I want to kind of um, do something that uh, I tried to do last year, but I'm meaning to do, which is like, just put more content out more regularly and addressing, because there's so many different angles as we've discovered during the last couple of hours, so many angles you can come at the present human condition from material and non-material. And what I set out to do all that, with all this in the, in the beginning was to help people. And that might sound very, oh, like, well, who do you think you are? You want to help people? Well, there's nothing wrong with that. And even if it's, in some cases, it'll just be to entertain. You know, if I've done a show about pop culture, about movies or TV, um, in others, it's to, to put forward information, ideas, thoughts, invite other people to share their experience and their insights so that we can try and move this whole um, human project along to do what I mentioned at the outset, which, you know, is to try and integrate some of these new insights, some of this new information. So if our day-to-day -day lives can improve, our interactions with each other improve, and our collective well-being can improve, and if there are elements whether human or otherwise, who don't have our best interests at heart. Well, maybe we could find a way to deal with that, to, to push through it, to sidestep it, to eliminate it, whatever it happens to be, you know? Because wh whatever you regard as happiness, what I want to do is help people have the, the most fulfilling lives that they can have. And I think that a lot of people um, might aspire to something like that. I think a lot, millions of people do this every day. Parents do it for their children. You know, millions of people do this. Nurses do it for patients. You know, people, we're helping each other in so many different ways every day. And a lot of it unrecognized and unacknowledged and not saying these individuals are looking for that, but acknowledged by just each other. You know, we're all in this together, um, like it or not. And that's why the, the hyper division atomization that we see, um, you know, personally, nationally, globally at the minute is so unhelpful so so destructive you know and i don't see how this can end well i don't think it's going to end in some kind of cataclysm but unless we you know alter the, or the course that we're on uh at the very least i think this is going to um result in that for the, for the two steps that we might have taken forward in the last two centuries it's going to result in one hell of a step back you know bernardo castro himself has acknowledged in his writing the possibility of the complete annihilation of the human project. And I said to him, consciousness remains, all goes on. And he said, yes, but look at where we've come to. Whether we're the peak of conscious manifestation in the material world, in the universe or not, look how far this project has come. It would be a shame for, for this species and everything it stood for and everything it's achieved and all that it could do to never be fulfilled, to just to be erased, to maybe start again a trillion years in the future, maybe not. You're still on mute, Anthony. <clears throat> Sorry, it's one of the things that I've thought of many times over the years is, as you say, the human project, the idea if, if it is the case that consciousness and self-aware consciousness has only evolved once, in the universe and it's wiped out. And I think it's something you said, it was, I don't think, was it you or was it some other article I was reading? But the idea that why do we fear, we're all mortal, so why do we fear the ending of humanity? Why do we, why does this upset us so much when we're gonna die anyway? And it's the idea that the loss of all the human achievements, all the poetry, all the music, We'll all just go and be forgotten. And that is such an awful thing to think about, which leads me to believe that we're invested within the human project because we are the human project and we are imbued in it in some way or other. So I think that was very, very wise words and fascinating words. And I, I felt they were heartfelt and I really appreciated that. Sarah, would you like to make a final point before we get our final bits and pieces from Greg? Yeah, I really enjoyed today's conversation. I always find it um, inspiring and interesting. And I think that 
it's important that people have conversations face to face. And I actually think, you know, one of the, when Corona first happened, I quite enjoyed everything going online because I can be a bit antisocial sometimes, don't like making small talk, don't drink, so don't bother going to pubs, don't really have these conversations that often with people. And now I'm starting to go, you know, when well, I've been out again for a while and, and meeting people in real life, I'm, I'm reignited that um, excitement that you get when you meet someone and you have a chat and you're on the same wavelength and it feels amazing. And we need to do more of that, I think. And, um, you know, the internet, internet creates a sort of false sense of connectivity, but one we should probably be more using to connect in real life with people and to have like genuine friendships and, and genuine bonding. Wonderful words. Right, Greg, any final points, how people can contact you, tell them more about your, um, your wonderful podcast and everything else as well? Here's your opportunity. Well, thank you very much, Anthony. <clears throat> the main website is simply legalize-freedom.com. You can spell legalize with an S or a Z. I registered both domains for the sake of our American friends. Legalize-freedom.com. There are hundreds of shows available there and other content. Um, <clears throat> more recent shows are half free, half subscription, but you'll find all the details there. YouTube channel is Legalize Freedom 1. You'll also find me at Legalize Freedom on Facebook and Twitter. Just do searches on those respective sites. And I think that's about it. I'm always happy to hear from people contact form is on the website uh you know what to do wonderful okay well thank you for that i thoroughly enjoyed it as always you think my god that was two hours where did it go where did it go it's exactly, just yeah so i mean i really appreciate the invitation <clears throat> excuse me it was a uh, really stimulating enjoyable um two hours Wonderful. And thank you very much. And um, thank you, everybody, for listening in live. Um, we will be I'll be posting an edited version of this in the sense of the start and ending um, in to probably tomorrow. But this will remain up for a few hours uh, for people to watch and then you'll get the edited version. So, Greg, thank you very much. And as always, Sarah, thank you for for, for just being Sarah and being with us here. It's 